Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 36. Today I sit down with Tom Secker of SpyCulture.com to discuss the National Geographic series, The Long Road Home. Here Tom and I note its lack of discussion on the historical and cultural questions surrounding the massive battle in Seder City, known by veterans of the battle as Black Sunday, and the military questions I have as a soldier who was fighting against the same Mahdi militia in southern Iraq at the same time. Rifle upon my shoulder and a rucksack on my back. Bullets, shells and shrapnel and a hellhound on my track. When I made it to my home place, I found triumph. Shining city stood a fortress on a hill. Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. For those new to the show, Danny and I are two progressive veterans who take the military and veteran stories of the day and add some much needed context. Tom Secker, welcome back to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for being with me today. Thanks for having me back. It's good to be talking to you again, my man. So, The Long Road Home. Um, I really, really enjoyed your piece on it. Um, I especially enjoy that you're a civilian who never served in the military looking at military things through a civilian lens. I think there are things that you pick out about it that somebody like me or even a uh if we were talking about british military former british military would um we uh when we met with uh, ben fountain a few months ago about his new book and he had writ- wrote um blanking on it, the um the long halftime show of billy lynn was the name of it and it's about a soldier who goes to a halftime show in 2004 in Texas. And it, it's great. It really is. It's, it, it, it's the, the, the key is there it's human stories, not military stories. I think that's the thing that everybody misses. Um, mm. So, um, so really enjoyed your piece. Um, can you give everybody just a, a real quick breakdown of what was in it? Okay. Well, I mean, this is something I wrote, I first stumbled across the series The Long Road Home in some army entertainment liaison office reports that I got, oh, I don't know, maybe six months ago. And I thought, this is something that's coming up every week. And uh, it mentioned that it filmed on Fort Hood in Texas. And I thought, this seems to be an important one. You know, there's a lot of different projects that the military works on. Some are more important than others, quite frankly. And this one, it seemed they were giving a lot of support to it over a very long period of time. So I put in a FOIA with the army, asking them for internal documents on their support to the show and their liaisons with the filmmakers and got back, oh, I don't know, what was it, about 300 pages or so of mostly emails. Um, And these emails go on for months and months and months. Uh, Some of them are from public affairs at Fort Hood. Some are from the entertainment liaison office. Some are from, you know, different parts of the army that were involved in this whole process. And basically they layout, albeit with some redactions, as always, um, this relationship. And it was a very close relationship. It was one that went on for a very long period. I mean, they they started building the set on Fort Hood in, I think it was, uh, what would it have been, January 2017. And this was before they'd even signed the production assistance agreement, which is actually a violation of DOD directives concerning liaisons with the entertainment industry they're not supposed to do that they're not supposed to actually start providing any kind of material support until a full contract is in place with estimated costings and all the rest of it so they were clearly pushing the boat out they were bending the rules on this one and i found out that uh for example um they tried to minimize the costs this was one of the big things that kind of bugged me about the whole process of supporting this production is not only did they you know they let them start 
building in, I think it was January. They were filming from like March through to July or something. This was a big, big project. And this involved months and months of people working at Fort Hood to support this thing. And yet it only cost them less than half a million dollars. When the initial estimate came in for support, it was about half a million dollars. And the producers kind of balked at it and said, oh, that seems a bit high. That seems a bit more than we wanted to spend. So the army set about finding imaginative ways to reduce those costs because the producer is supposed to pay the army for everything. Every last hour of someone working on it, every last, you know, milliliter of fuel that gets used in moving these vehicles around for filming, absolutely everything so that it doesn't cost the taxpayer a buck. Yet the army really, really, they did something I've never heard them do before, where they essentially redefined a lot of the moving the vehicles around as training. They were arguing that, oh, right, if we say that the convoy out to the set, we've got to move these vehicles out to the set every day for filming. If we call that training, then we don't have to charge the production company for it. And yet, how can, you know, driving in a straight line out towards a set really be considered training? Come on. So they were effectively subsidizing in an economic sense, as well as a sort of cultural and production sense. Uh, They were subsidizing this production, which they're not legally supposed to do or even are allowed to do. So I thought this was a pretty, you know, pretty big discovery. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, the uh, moving convoys of vehicles takes hours and hours and hours. Um, it's something I did a lot when I was still in the service and it, 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 it's one of the first things I think people toss away when they look at military films and especially for this film, given the size of the set. Um, and of course that, you know, we, as soldiers, we have to return, uh, any secure, any, uh, sensitive equipment like, like Humvees, like Bradley's or, you know, what they were using back to the motor pool every day. And so it's a it's a great point that the cost in, in fuel, the cost, at least at personnel costs, there's innumerable ways that the production would have been charged. And yet they were not. Um, and and that, that really, really says something about who wanted to push this film, this uh, film series. Oh, certainly. I mean, this thing wasn't conceived by the Pentagon exactly. But as soon as the uh, request for assistance came in. They were like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is definitely something we want to be involved in. This is the exact sort of production that the military loves to support. And there's even a bit in, in one of the emails where they're not just talking about this thing about the convoy out to set, but there's also some line about, you know, and anything else that a sort of imaginative or inventive uh, accountants officer could come up with. Exactly. So presumably, presumably there were other things that they cut off the bill. And you have to wonder, I mean, that can save tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they're not really supposed to, I mean, I know the Pentagon's got, you know, more money than God, but they're not supposed to be spending it on this, are they? No, no. And, and the, it, it creates that, that, that great nebulous environment that lots of elements of the military kind of operate in, you know, that, that, oh, I didn't really see that. And that's the first guy you talk to when you talk to the ninth guy involved and he's like, well, I didn't either. And Okay, well, I guess nothing happened. It's, it's, a, it's a very minimalist perspective on study and history and understanding, uh, understanding the military. Um, and that's one of the big, big things that uh, I noticed watching it. Um, so uh, what else? What else about the, the Pentagon's uh, the emails struck you, Tom? Um, just the sheer sort of closeness between the production company and the, and the military. Um, I mean, the relationship, they couldn't have made this show without the military, no. essentially, or they certainly couldn't have made it in the way that they did. Um, the military not only saved them a lot of money, it saved them a lot of time and hassle. If you can imagine trying to rent these vehicles privately and build a whole Iraqi village set yourself rather than being able to adapt one. I mean, that was something I found kind of quite disturbing. I mean, I knew that various military bases had these kind of Middle Eastern or Iraqi training village sets, because I guess if you're going to send people out to fight in those kinds of conditions and circumstances, it makes sense to train them on something approximating that. But the notion of turning one into a movie set in order to tell the story of people who did actually train on that set years ago and yeah. then went out to Iraq, some of whom died and some of whom came back pretty horribly injured. 
the notion of then turning, you know, that training village into an actual movie set, I found kind of disturbing and twisted. Um, I don't know what you quite quite what you make of it, having actually, you know, been in the army. But yeah, that that bothered me. And it didn't just bother me, as, as you know, reading the article, it bothered Cindy Sheehan, whose son died in the events portrayed in The Long Road Home. She was saying, you know, it's, it, I can't remember exactly what word she was she used, but yeah, she was saying basically it's sick that, you know, her son trained on that, that village set, went out to Iraq, died, and then years later, that story was sort of told using that same training set as a movie set. Yeah, it, it is quite breathtaking. I, I don't know that I've ever, uh, I don't know that there's a more low place in in the connection to history in making that choice. Um, you know, and, and I'll commend the, you know, whoever commissioned the buildings there for training, they, they did a great job. The buildings are quite accurate from the places that I saw in Iraq. And I'm, I'm guessing that was probably part of the appeal for them to use that was that instead of having to go to, say, probably Morocco or some other uh, third world place that could closely approximate, uh, approximate part of Baghdad, they have this really nice set. And, oh, we happen to have this huge supply of vehicles nearby. Now, I think to the places that I trained on at Fort Lewis, and some of them were, were quite well built and were great for training, but they didn't look like Iraq. They didn't get that feeling. And there were parts of watching it where I, I could look at the camera, look through the camera, and everything I would see would be something I, I would have seen there. And so I think that that it, it, it adds to the realism, but we have to admit that that also adds to the propaganda value because other guys are going to watch and, uh, you know, maybe they, they aren't listening to the dialogue much, but they, the visuals really speak to them. And I, I think that that needs to be pointed out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know when I was watching it, I had, I think they did a fairly good job. And, you, and as you said, and you sent me some photos and things and said, you know, this is kind of what parts of Baghdad and parts of Iraq look like. But yeah, yeah. It, it, it was just that sort of that very blocky thing where everything's 90 degrees and everything's very geometric because it's been done in quite a cheap way where they've just sort of oh, with you yes. know, cement blocks or whatever. That quality to it, I just, after several episodes, I think it took me several episodes for that to really kind of chime in and for me to notice that. But afterwards, I couldn't not notice it you know what i mean i was kind of sat there yeah no, kind of being bothered um, by the fact that you know when they're sneaking down a little alley it's this this perfectly straight perfectly geometric alley built out of you know cement yes block. yes yes no it uh there was one establishing shot in one of the first episodes that they went down a a long road but next to it was grass and there were power lines and i'm like this is supposed to be iraq I know I've never seen that kind of uniformity in their power setup because, you know, 19 different people worked on it. They don't have power companies there that have regulations and stuff. So people put up their own what, whatever they could be. But yeah, seeing that it was kind of, you know, I, I wonder who the advisors to this were, because that, that's something that I've, I've, I have a question about, too, that some of these shots is like you, you can't that can't that wasn't in look nothing like Iraq, but it still stayed. So, you know, who was really giving them giving them, them the advice? I actually don't know who was the series technical advisor. I assume they, I mean, they will have hired a, some sort of military veteran who's now working in Hollywood as a technical advisor. Yeah. Um, I know that the, one of the emails that where it's, they're kind of like production notes, they're partway through filming. Um, the military make production notes on how the thing's going. And it does say that they were working very closely with the technical advisor. And any time the director kind of wanted to go off and do his own thing, they'd get the technical advisor and the military guys there to sort of, you know, push him in the right direction, as it were. Yeah. Um, but it does also show realism is the stated reason or one of the stated reasons why the military is involved in Hollywood. And yet time after time, we see these military sponsored productions that get some things really quite right but something's horribly wrong. And so that anyone who'd actually experienced any of this would, would notice these things, would spot them and feel, hang on, that's, that's just not right. That's just not how it was. Why have they done it like that? So it kind of puts a lie to that whole excuse for the DOD in Hollywood, I think, once again, that they're not primarily interested in realism and accuracy no. and presenting the military in the most sort of clear and accurate way, like they keep saying that's what they're there for. It's 
primarily about propaganda and often accuracy is kind of an afterthought and they're sort of well we'll just sort of you know throw throw accuracy out the window if it gets in the way of what we want to do um and that whole thing about uh, sergeant mitchell uh did you did you get anywhere with this this is something i found bizarre one of the characters who is reported dead in the series who died in the battle of sada city uh, was a Sergeant Mitchell, yet one of the emails says that he actually died in a later operation in the in the same place as part of the, sort of the same large battle. Um, but yet they didn't insist on that being accurate. Did you get anywhere with that? Did you figure that one out at all or not? Um, no, I, I, I didn't. Aside from the obvious change uh, and, and, and to me, that's, it's very offensive and very uh, you know, this, to change that in a story, it tells me that the writers don't care about the story at all, because w- w- when and where people die matters. It matters to the guys that died with him. It matters to the leaders. Um, you know, I have a it lot of questions. That of, guy's friends alongside him. Yes. It, yeah. And and, you know, to change it, you know, dates, times, places, um, you know, it, 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 it tells me that they're they're the people making it are looking at it in such a uniform way that there, there is no chance of showing any humanity. They don't want that to come through. Um, at least not on the military side. I've noticed several places in the series where leaders made decisions that showed some kind of humanity where that wouldn't actually happen in the army. Good example would be, uh, when Lieutenant Aguero's, uh, squad is surrounded on two sides and those two groups of insurgents that were using human shields are moving up to it. By the way, I'm trying to figure out if that actually happened or not. I haven't found anything that says the insurgents use human shields there. But there's a point after one of the insurgents starts shooting where the lieutenant doesn't give the order and none of his men start firing. That would not happen in real life. I'm not saying about the lieutenant pausing or not wanting his men to shoot at a specific time. I'm talking about all those guys pointed at, the, you know, there's not a question. It's not, did I get shot at or where did it come from? They can see the bad mm. guy. Mm. Res- restraining them at that moment, that critical moment would be almost impossible. One of them would have started shooting. And when one of them started shooting, the others would have started as well. The idea, I, I didn't count the exact amount of time it was from the, the first AK going off to the them actually firing the LT, giving the order, but it was probably at least a minute. A minute is forever in combat. Um, mm. And so I, I really feel like that they were trying to establish that this lieutenant had more control than he would have had and that the soldiers had more control than they would have had. Um, you know, and, and that's not to say specifically, you know, I'm, I'm not, they want to defend themselves. It's a horrifying moment, but um, and as I mentioned before, I don't know if they actually did use human shields there because that's I think that's another one of these changes we can put in the bucket um, because it really it really fundamentally shifts how Americans in this light would see the enemy and they would see them in a much, much harsher way. And so you have you know, the series is peppered with all kinds of little moments like this. Um and the bad guys are worse. And so it, it kind of gingerly pushes people to their corners. If you're good guys, you go in the good direction. You're bad guys, you go in the bad direction. But nothing that really pushes them the other way. Um, the one no, and I know that, what you mean. There's, there's, um, oh, sorry, go on. What was the exception to that? The one exception to that I saw was the sergeant that was wounded uh, guarding the family. His fear... Mm. And the fact that it was pointed at them at that moment, so shortly after he had been wounded, I put that, that that's not on him. I don't put that on him. The LT made a wise decision taking his weapon, but he did it in front of the family. He embarrassed that sergeant in front of all those people. He could have taken him outside. They could have gotten in a Humvee and quietly done it themselves without embarrassing him. I think that was done to show the LT acting in front of the family, showing the family what he was willing to do to protect them. Mm-hmm. I would not see that happening in real life. I don't mm-hmm. think, I mean, the, the, an LT might take somebody's weapon, but 
You take um, them around the corner and do it quietly and privately and make your point exactly, there. Exactly. And that's what I mean about the, the, the compartmentalization of the military is that, you know, one team doesn't always do what the other team's doing. They're busy doing their own shit. So it, 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 um, uh, but yeah. And, um, um, anyway, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. I went on a lot longer there. <laughs> no, sure. Sure, man. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the bit with the human shields, um, I've not come across anything that actually says that's real. I mean, maybe that's what happened. I really don't know. But you're right. The whole series is peppered with moments like that, like uh, where the young girl kind of comes out from behind a building and she kind of waves at one of the soldiers. And then her dad comes out with an AK-47 and starts shooting at him. Yeah. And he's obviously, you know, using his, his daughter as a kind of distraction, if you like. Um, and it is sort of designed to show this, uh, that the enemy force is just this sort of ruthless barbaric, hateful scum who deserve to die. Um, yeah. That's the underlying message that comes through in, in all of this. I mean, their, their motives are never explained at all. Their reasons for doing this or their um, any kind of context or any kind of explanation, even if you think it's an explanation that doesn't justify what they did, you could still offer it, offer it. You could still present it and say there is at least some kind of reason why this happened. Yeah. Rather than just presenting this as kind of a sort of horrible bolt out of the blue for a bunch of guys who are on some, you know, relatively routine mission guarding some sewerage trucks. Um, and yeah, particularly the bit with the human shields and the, the pause after the two crowds at either end of the alley start shooting at the soldiers. You're right. I mean, surely your training as a soldier is if there's a target that you can see straightforwardly and they're shooting at you, you've got to fire back because otherwise people might die. Part of the whole point of you know, being a, a team and being a trained army is that you, you simply react according to your training. You have to fire at that point, because what other choice is there? Yeah, um, yeah. And if you don't, one of those bullets is going to hit the guy next to you, or you. So it's, it's kind of a, there isn't really a decision to be made at that point. And that's, I mean, you know, that's horrible, but that's warfare. And that's how you've kind of got to train people for warfare. Because otherwise, they're, you know, they're, they're just stood there while people are shooting at them. I mean, that's no way to fight a war. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so no, I, I think that you're absolutely right that that was to try and add a, I don't know, a kind of slight softness and a slight sense of morality or something to things when at a point when it makes no sense to start having some kind of moral question about this. I mean, if people are shooting at you, you can have the moral debate later. The important thing is to stay alive. So Exactly. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was very strange. I mean, that's kind of the dramatic high point of the whole series. Because for most of it, that, that one unit are kind of you know, hidden out in this house. And for a lot of the time, they're just sort of cowering behind walls and kind of trying to keep their sectors covered and what have you. Um, but in terms of actual action, that's probably the high point. And that's the point at which they tried to slip in this thing about, oh, well, you know, you've got to see these soldiers as ultimately, you know, very, very moral people, particularly when compared with the enemy, who are so horrible and using, you know, innocent civilians as human shields. It was so utterly one-sided and so utterly simplistic when, you know... And given the extent that they went to to show you the kind of backstories of several of these different major characters, and they kind of, you know, in each episode, or at least each of the first six, I think, they actually pick one person's story and kind of show you all the way through. None of that is done for any of the people on the other side. No. They are just an evil Arab horde out of nowhere who want to kill. And that's it. And that's... <laughs> Not what happened, <laughs> most fundamentally. I mean, as, as we were discussing in, in some of our emails and things, there is a whole kind of backstory to why the Battle of Sadr City and why Sadr City, which was up until that point relatively peaceful, why it suddenly kind of exploded into horrific violence. But there's no attempt in the series to explain that. It's all <laughs> lots of scenes of guys with their wives at home. Well, okay, fine, I get it, but what about the other people? Why, why, did this, why did they do this? Surely that's something that in eight hours of television you could devote at least a bit of time to trying to explore and explain. Absolutely. 
I, I, I completely agree. I, in listening to you talk, I, I'm, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of something about um, propaganda that I forget a lot, and that it's we uh, propaganda is designed to work on everybody, whether you're a soldier or not. So all these family scenes, mom being mad and stomping off because brother's going to go back to the war again. Um, you know, I, I want to say they're all threads to pull on family, on military family members, um, and 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 creating those questions in their in their minds, because I think that's 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 the biggest thing is that they want people to have questions. They want because eventually their soldier, whomever it, they happen to be, and whatever connection they have, is going to walk down this path. That's kind of the the mind state I'm hearing, and so whether or not to reenlist whether or not to um, say that the Iraq war was, well, it was a really messy war and a lot of bad stuff happened, but I still think we did the right thing, you know, that it supports those kind of very vapid history list thoughts um, that don't properly convey it. And because we're in a, a, a period of time now where war is everywhere, that's, I think that's what they have to do. They have to convince everybody in the family that it's acceptable. Um, when choices are never that simple, but they want to. They, I, I know I mentioned uh, to you about the linear storylines, you know, that they really, really want to grab on those linear storylines because those are easier for people to pick up on, especially men. You know, it's easier for a man to watch an action movie, come out of it. And yeah, those guys are tough sons of bitches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But but not have hard questions, you know, because there were maybe a hard question in that movie. Well, this thing is full of hard questions and nobody answers. Nobody, you know, and it's like, it's like, what the fuck's going on here? You know, here's, here's, here's one. The, uh, the LMTV, that was the open back flat little tiny semi truck. Those guys were having with 16 guys in it, 16. Had that truck been hit by an IED? You're talking at least 10 dead soldiers, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, you know, it, you know, I, I didn't hear any of them talk about that. What the fuck is this shit? We don't have armor. I don't understand it, you know, and, and there's another one. So in the beginning of the Iraq war, um, aside from our heavy armor, we did not, uh, the American military did not have very many up armored Humvees. That's what we would call them. Um, we had lots of the soft skin ones, and that's mainly what you see in the movie, aside from the big Bradleys. They are a bunch of different designations of them all different ones you know this one has this kind of pump this one doesn't or some crap but um none of them had armor the colonel did in martha raddatt's book it says the colonel had one of the few up armored humvees yet his patrol these guys that were out patrolling and fighting didn't mm -hmm. have that humvee and see, that's 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 one thing that I consider about leadership. And I know Danny does as well, is that you always lead from the front. And if your soldiers don't have something, you don't have it either. You know, you don't um, you don't allow yourself to believe that you're protected because you're not there. You know, I sent them out on patrol. They're fine. They'll be back, whatever. That's very much part and parcel of the U.S. military attitude. Um, so, but anyways, Don Rumsfeld uh, got asked by a reporter about that. You know, there were letters being sent home for guys that didn't have body armor. Yes, there were some National Guard guys that did deploy with no body armor. And along with the un unarmored Humvees, uh, his response was, um, well, you go to war with the army you, you have. And <laughs> as someone that studied the Iraq war and knows how full of shit Donald Rumsfeld is, what the hell was he talking about? They picked when to go. They, I mean, yes, it was post 9-11 and they wanted to whip us all up and get us going. But what they did, they, they chose when to do it, when they thought it was OK. Why not go with the right army? If we're so above board, if we're so caring about our soldiers, why the fuck did not an entire army of up armored Humvees and appropriately armored vehicles go into this war as opposed to send in the fucking army you have that's that's a it's it's, it's, a, it's a macho male i'm gonna drive through it instinct and it mm -hmm. doesn't work in leadership it doesn't leadership requires sacrifice and those fuckers have no idea about it 
you know, the, 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 the President Bush that just got that Liberty Medal back here um, for work with veterans. Yeah, that's those are the fuckers that, that thought that was a great idea. So um, so if you don't mind, Tom, I was going to go through a little bit of, of my list here. Uh, some all I'll, I'll chalk off some of the stuff that we've already hit. Um, sure. So I want to talk a little bit about Seder City itself. Um, it was originally called Revolution City. And it was actually built uh, in 1959, and it ended up becoming a stronghold of the Iraqi Communist Party. And they said that the resistance to the Ba'athist-led coup, Saddam's party, in 63 was very strong there. In 1982, the city was, the district was renamed Saddam City. It became known for poverty, uh, and then it was renamed Sadr City again in April 2003. So there's a couple other points to hit about Sadr City, but this is more about the people that live there, the Shia, Shia Muslims. Um, mm. They, uh, our participation in the Iran-Iraq war certainly killed thousands of them um, with the arming we did of Iraq. Um, during the Gulf War, you have all those deaths, including the ones that uh, rose up uh, following George Bush Sr.'s uh, speeches telling them to rise up against Saddam and fight him. I want to say that the deaths there were around 200,000. Then there were the sanctions by the Clinton administration that caused widespread famine in Iraq. None of these were referenced whatsoever. According to this series, as I watched it, the war began on April 4th, 2004. Um, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And that's also to include Martha Raddatz. I went through Martha Raddatz's book. I didn't read it cover to cover. But there is no mention of any of those things in her book. There's also no mention of the closing of the newspaper and radio station that was used by uh, Muqtada Sadr and his followers at the time. We, our coalition provisional authority, closed it down in March. Ten days later, there was this uprising. That was how Sadr spoke to his followers. Who wouldn't rise up at that moment, especially with a foreign power sitting outside your front door. Um, when Saddam was in power, every newspaper in the country was a government-run one where criticizing Saddam was illegal. Following his fall, more than 30 newspapers started. But the people knew they were just trading one dictator for another. You know, it, it, it does. It, they, they weren't dumb about it. Another thing that happened, and again, our, we, we don't spend nearly enough time looking at the religious significance of what happens over there. But on the 13th of August in 03, a helicopter knocked down a Shia religious banner. It caused a ton of outrage, and they were told that it was done on purpose to knock the banner down and that the pilot would be punished. I, I mean to do research on that. I haven't. But the. The fact that it, it wasn't mentioned and given that it was so important in other coverage I've read, yeah, we, we, we have no concept of, of how to uh, peacefully treat Muslim people. We just don't. Or, uh, you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Peacekeeping mission. Bunches and bunches of these assholes called it a peacekeeping mission. I was in, in Iraq during this time in April 2004. None of us called it a peacekeeping mission. None of our commanders mm. called it a peacekeeping mission. The president of the United States, as far as I know, didn't call it a peacekeeping mission. I was there again in 2007 and eight, And despite the province that I was in being very quiet, there was huge fighting still going on in Baghdad. Soldiers, we, we, we feel comfortable calling it peacekeeping when all of our when no one's dying anymore. Uh, different soldiers might just say other soldiers dying, but I'm saying nobody. So the fact that this this series went so hard to paint a very early in the war spot as a peacekeeping mission, ah, oh, it's a bunch of bullshit. I, I um, you know, I, I I was never told that as a soldier, and if I had, it would have just seemed beyond disingenuous. Um, religious mentions. Colonel Volsky, he says, God willing, and uh, God, God will do this, God will do that a bunch of times in here. I don't know that anyone in the army would actually fly for that. 
you know, because it, 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 most most people in the army are religious, but not very closely. So it was it was Certainly weird. Not openly devout in that way. It, exactly. Yeah. You know how in, in a professional sense, how would he consider bringing this in? We're not talking about a chaplain giving an invocation at the beginning of a ceremony. That's kind of typical and boilerplate. I understand that. But, um, you know, I, I think you and I talked about, too, with for your article, God willing, these guys will be the last ones to die. That, you know, the, that movement of Sergeant Mitchell's death allowed them to hand this very specific spot to the colonel. Um, you know, that the, the colonel said nobody else is going to die. And, and he did it by God. You know, it must be a fucking great guy. Um, or even more than that, that this must have somehow been fated from beyond. Yes. That, that's an element that I've noticed increasingly in, um, uh, in particular in The Last Ship. You ever seen this, this big, big Navy-sponsored production TV show? Uh, it was produced by Michael Bay. Um, and in that, they kind of openly invoke this idea that they are somehow, they've somehow been chosen by God to be on this mission. And it's, a, it's not quite that explicit in, in The Long Road Home, but they do lay it on pretty thick, this notion that he's on some kind of almost divine mission. Um, yeah, and that's... I mean, I, I just think that's a nasty way of weaponizing people's metaphysical and religious beliefs in order to sell them something which, as far as I'm aware, most religions think is morally wrong. I mean, most yes. religions don't morally justify warfare. I mean, regardless of the number of wars that have actually been fought in the name of religion, I mean, I get it. But, you know, for the most part, when they explicitly state their morality, it's anti-war. Yes. So the notion that th this guy would be almost the, the embodification um, of God's will <laughs> is, yeah, it's screwed up. It, and, and again, and it's sold in this sort of emotive way, this emotive, dramatic way where you're not yeah. in any way encouraged to think about, well, hang on, what's the... What's the implication of this scene? You're just supposed to get sort of caught up in the emotion of it and think, oh, you know, he's a nice guy and a good Christian and, you know, God bless him for being out there kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's thoughts and prayers. It's, it's the, you know, it's, it's, yeah. that, it's that very light touch to things because people, we've, we've kind of all been conditioned that if we notice something's really serious, we either have to dive in deep or just avoid it because it, 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 I think it's just a little bit of nervousness, but I think it scares us. Um, and especially with war, war and the military are incredibly touchy subjects. So, you know, there's so much in here that is nonverbal. It's not even stuff that they did. I made a list uh, when you're talking about the, the religious part of it. I, I call them uh, myth, mythic action scenes, uh, very much the the horse, the horse charge and 12 strong. Um <laughs> The colonel, while he was briefly out, and again, you know, this was hours and hours. It's not an examination of the actual fight. But in the very brief time in the series, that the colonel was outside the wire on a patrol trying to get his men. He managed to remove a grenade from a soldier's pouch before it exploded. It had gotten shot and he managed to get it out of his pouch and throw it before it exploded. Mm. Would never have happened if the grenade had not exploded at that point. And it was it did its fuse did go off. He wouldn't have had time, but it's a it's a but it's real easy to to add that into his pile. You know, add that to things that he's done that um, go like that. The other one, another one, was when Staff Sergeant Miltenberger was at that intersection with the bird. Remember, what the, was it a, yeah. it was like a crow or a raven, and the colonel the, and they tied those two events together. They tied the time of those two things. Who the fuck knows if they actually happened at all near each other, but we're supposed to, to look at that, that the colonel saw the bird and suddenly, Hey, we, we got, we got reinforcements. We're going to be okay. Suddenly staff Sergeant Miltenberger sees the bird and, and he knows that's dangerous. And it's like every once in a while in real life that does happen, but it has nothing to do with each other. The, 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 it's just that you got an inclination of something and went with it, but it, it does. It just, it just adds to that stack. Wow. This guy's really sharp. Wow. Nobody else died under his command. Wow. He was able to pull that grenade out. It just adds to the, uh, just adds to the pile of bullshit. Well, yeah, sure. Sure. But again, that thing with the bird with uh, Milton Berger, 
it's like that's a, that acts as a kind of bad omen, and he realizes, no, 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 we've got to stop the truck because otherwise we're just going to get shot to pieces here. And yeah. He's right, of course. You know that truck is completely, it's terribly equipped for the kind of battle they're actually going into. You'd never, I mean, why would you even send in a vehicle like that into that kind of setup? I don't, I don't even understand that. But like you say, a lot of the vehicles just simply weren't equipped for the task at hand. Yeah. Um, but there again, it's like. Oh, fate must be on the side of the Americans because the bird flew out to give them the bad omen at just the right yeah, moment exactly. before they all died. Um, and it's really so now nature and God <laughs> are somehow <laughs> on, on, on the side of, you know, NATO and the empire yeah. against these, you know, Muslim savages, which they are. I mean, that's almost exclusively how every Muslim in the entire or, or Arab, if they even, you know, presumably some of them aren't Muslims, um, are portrayed in the whole thing. The family themselves, even the family in this house, there's like a few dramatic scenes with them, but we never really get to know who they are or no. what they think about any of this. They're not given any kind of agency or voice in the show at all. Hey, everyone. I really hope you're enjoying the podcast. But truth be told, I need your help. No, I don't need you to move a couch or borrow a leaf blower. No, I need you to hit pause on your podcasting app right now and share this episode with somebody you know, somebody who you might think might be receptive to it. It could be a, a friend or relative who's considering joining the military or a veteran you know who might be interested in, in hearing a little more truth in their news about uh, military and veterans. We rely on you all to help us reach as many people as possible. So please hit that pause button right now and share this episode with somebody. Sharing all done? Good. Okay, good deal. I know Uncle Al will cuss a lot listening to the episode, but he'll appreciate it when the cursing stops. Now I want to mention something about Patreon. We are always in the market for more Patreon supporters. So if you get the chance, please come out and support us. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month. And what do you get for your dollar, you ask? Well, you get a one minute drop on any topic you choose once a month. Just email us your question or comment and we'll give it the old Henry Danny breakdown on air. Guaranteed to have 60 seconds of our time. We may spend more on it. Um, uh, we prefer to do military and veteran topics, but whatever topic you think might be pertinent. And we may spend a whole bunch more time talking about it, depending on the topic. And for contributors, a bit north of a dollar a month, we have some bonus episodes, some essays of mine, and a few other things as well. We're still in the process of, of building our rewards. So if you have any suggestions for Patreon rewards, please let me know. Fortress on a Hill is expanding. We're going to start doing chapter series as part of our lineup. There are some topics that are simply too big and important to leave to discussing in a single headline. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank all of our honorary producers who are helping us do just that. We rely on the support of our patrons through Patreon to help keep the podcast a success. Thank you to Matthew Ho, Will RNs, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James Higgins, and James Obar. Anyone who contributes $10 or more a month on Patreon will be listed here as an honorary producer. And to all of our contributors on Patreon, thank you for helping us do this. Now, back to the podcast. The more that I see moments like this in military films, the more that I know that there's nothing, nothing really of substance of it. For example, you mentioned about the family. I would made a note about that. The dad made a comment. Um, yeah, so the interpreter's father said he's grateful to the Americans for freeing them from Saddam. My question was, is would he really say that? I mean, I, I, I guess it's, it's, it's plausible. And his wife asked him why. And he said, he says it's different this time. And the wife asks how, and the husband says he feels it. You know, they're the, the, the only agency given to these people is American agency. 
is that when they're, you know, when they do what they're told, when, when Jossum, you know, does exactly remember when he went to help his, his father with the pills and everything. And that soldier was Mm -hmm. right at the cusp of shooting him. Um, uh, but again, yeah, they're tied up on the floor crying. They could be anyone in any number of situations. And again, we don't know how they feel. We don't know actually what's happening there. Um, so and the and the mistake with that the 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 putting the wounded soldier in charge of guarding the family mm. that could have been fodder for a massacre just right there, you know. Well, it, uh, well and, not just and, a not just a wounded soldier, but a wounded soldier who's having a panic attack. Yeah, no, yeah, no, and and, and you're right. No, he is. He's some guys get wounded and they just they don't care. Um, but no, it it uh, the. Um, I want to say there was uh, a ricochet or a uh, something on his lip. It was uh, the yeah, yeah, something a, it's a ricochet, around through I the think. wall a frag- and a fragment clips him in the face or so, something. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, it, it did. It terrified the hell out of him. And again, that that's an understandable state of being. You know, we get mm. that. We get where he's at, panicking and wanting to get away from the thing. But then he's set downstairs to guard the family, and I'm like, oh my god, this is horrible. I mean, even if you're you're short on people, which the lieutenant, despite being trapped there, wasn't short on people. He had manpower to do a few things if he needed to. Um, puts him in charge. Watch these people. Protect them. Make sure they're all safe. I, I just wanted to get up and punch the shit out of lieutenant. Um, so who, who is portrayed so well? I mean, you, you yeah. were talking before about some of the kind of almost sort of magical things that people do at times in this series. Um, I mean, there was one with him uh, just after the ambush has taken place when they when they start going down the side alley to find a house to hold up and, you know, a taller building where they're fit so they can have some kind of observation point on top. Um, he's walking straight down the middle of the alley, which makes no sense if you've just been ambushed because you I don't know, that too. you know, yeah. And why weren't the military saying, no, he would never in a million years just be walking straight down the middle of the alley in the most exposed possible position he could have chosen? Um, And then there's the bit right at the end, or I think it's right at the end of the seventh episode, where he's chasing the tanks down the street because the tanks Mm -hmm. have gone past and missed them. And And he must be running for a couple of hundred yards through buildings that, as far as we're concerned, are just full of gunmen shooting at him. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a... um, yet, when it comes to, like you say, making a, a straightforward sort of tactical decision about, you know, where am I going to station my personnel? Which roles am I going to give to which people? He makes this most appalling blunder, but it isn't really treated as his blunder. It's treated as a like it's the soldier's fault. The guy who's just been it hit is. in the face. It is. The guy who thinks he's been shot in the face. I mean, you know, anyone who thinks I've taken a bullet to the face is going to panic, aren't they? Because that's that's just shock straight up. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe if it, you know, you get, you know, I don't know, a smaller injury in the leg or something, it wouldn't have the same effect on you. But, you know, your face, your head, it's a very, it's a very sensitive thing. So you can totally understand his reaction. And like you say, it just makes no sense to send him down to almost the most difficult role in the whole house. People, he doesn't, he can't speak their language. You know, how are you supposed to guard people when you can't even talk to them in your own language when you're suffering a panic attack? It just, it's absurd. And and like you say, uh, the Lieutenant uh, Aguero, I think his name is, Mm -hmm. comes out of the whole thing shining. He's supposed to be one of the heroes in all of this. It's it's bizarre. This is what it is. It's kind of bizarre and irrational when you actually start picking it apart. No, it is. It's... it's, uh... There's quite a few things here that I had I had questions about stuff that he did. Um, example for one thing for him is that they keep saying they don't know where they are in the city. You know that they don't understand where they're at, and hmm. that that may have happened in the first moments of the ambush. But after a time, they know where they are. I mean, they may be off by 500 meters or so, but they can go to their map and look and say, okay. We're close to this. We're near this. The series makes it seem like the other military forces had almost no idea. We know that they're in these or four blocks or six blocks. I don't think it was like that. 
because that's one of the first things that you do when you get ambushed and stuck somewhere is you figure out exactly where you are. And again, you might be a little off, but to be so far off that the entire through the series, it's like we still don't know where they are. We're going to have to push through this whole long road to find them because we don't know. Well, they may have had to push through the whole long road, but yeah, they're going to be in this little section. That's where they are, is what we should have heard somebody say. And we didn't and we didn't get that at all. Also, the staff sergeant that is second to the lieutenant in that ambush squad, he is right on the verge of, of mutant or not mutiny, but actually he's passed in subordination. Some of the things that he questioned the LT about. Um, yes, he does speak the language. I think they kind of wanted to make that a uh, a one two punch where you got the combat version LT and the experienced sergeant. And we're going to listen to the experienced sergeant who wants more violence for some reason. I think that, you know, that that was definitely purposeful. Hmm. We, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real common thing in the Army. You have a, an inexperienced officer or inexperienced at their particular level with a higher ranking NCO. And it's, you know, it's how people go up the chain of command. For every commander, every general, there is a command sergeant major that, that advises him. Hmm. Um, and so I think that they took... They took that NCO thing for a spin. This guy had been deployed before. He speaks Arabic. He um, is suspicious of the family pretty much the whole time, despite the fact that he speaks Arabic and could have sat there and listened to him for hours and know what was going on. Um, they made it seem like Jostam, the interpreter, was loyal to the military pretty much throughout, didn't they? It just he, he wasn't he didn't spill his guts about who his family was. He just mm -hmm. continued on, but he towed the army line, not not the not the interpreter line at all, if that is a line. Um, but as far as that, you know, the questions that he was asking through the series, I think, are valid questions. And when he found his friend murdered, it was clear it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be the U.S. military that we're looking at for the murder. It was mm. the 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 Monty Army guys. But the question is, is that in a war, can you do that? Can you divide down who's going to be violent and who isn't, who is trustworthy and who isn't? Um, yeah, and then it's and, a, yeah, uh, it's a difficult one. Yeah, and I hear what you're saying. I, yeah, and and it it gave me the impression that they might have considered Jossum to be like a solder plant, like he was somebody who would listen in and then inform on on the U.S. military. And I, I don't know if that happened. I'm a, I'm a, I assume it did with different interpreters. It did, it did happen time to time, usually not in, in a big way. Um, but with his meeting with Sauter, um, which, as I know, as far as I know, at that particular time, he, he was on the run from his life. So the fact that he was there conveniently before this all began to 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 minister to to this to this guy, I don't I don't buy that at all. Um, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't add up. Yeah. Um, but you, but you've got to have some kind of, um, I, I guess, image of the bad guy. You've got to have some kind of leadership do. that sort of, in some way, explains why these, all these hundreds of gunmen, these seemingly endless numbers of gunmen, uh, are doing all of this. Um, and it's kind of ironic that, perhaps not ironic, that it's in the episode where we're finding out about Jossim's background. Um, that that's where we get to see him. Because he's otherwise not really referred to, as I recall, anywhere in the series. They don't no, actually no. talk about who this army is, who this, you know, uh, Shia militia is, or why no. they're, or let alone why they're doing this, what their reasons or motives are. Um, and also, I mean, the first time I watched the series, because I actually watched it twice, um, I did notice how, you know, you've got this interpreter character and he's, you know, when they're just out on patrol in the initial episode, he's, you know, he's one of the guys and they're quite friendly towards him and all of that. And you get this kind of very simplistic, you know, good Muslim, bad Muslim thing going on. And then as soon as the initial ambush is over and they've taken refuge in this house, they turn around and accuse him of being some kind of spy or infiltrator mm -hmm. or someone who's in some way betrayed them and you know he's the reason why this has happened and i was thinking right so even the one 
Muslim that you're willing to accept is actually kind of a good guy, even he's got to be subject to suspicion at least some of the time. Yeah. And it's it's kind of viciously prejudiced in a lot of ways, this series. I'm sure people will watch it and say, oh, yeah, but, you know, they did have an Iraqi guy who's an interpreter, and we do get to learn his background as well. So, you know, it's all kind of whatever. Um, but that's not actually what it's doing. It, no. It's, no. It, out of the hundreds and hundreds of Arabs and Muslims that you see in this series, the vast majority of them are just violent, savage maniacs with apparently no reason for being so. Um, uh, cow- cowardly, to include cowardly, there was that guy that yeah. got up from the pile of dead women and children, and he was, you know, had been the instigator, you remember, and then he just ran off. Um, you know, that these are these little subtle, subtle things in there, you know, and I think the thing with Jossum keeping his family secret is that um, this is exactly the point you're thinking about is that they're, they're all, they're trying to show that dis- disloyalty comes no matter what it may be right in here in our face, or it may be a little bit down the road, but that the betrayal is going to happen. The question is, will you be prepared for it? Um, you know, and, and I, I, I know from, from serving, that was kind of the attitude that we had in, you know, that there, we did hear about interpreters sharing information about us, but granted, we, we'd never really shared much that could be used against us. Um, but the idea, like you said, that they're all bad, that, that they're, they're not a trustworthy son of a bitch in the crowd. You know, I think that that was really the theme of this, you know, that they, they, they wanted to show as much humanity of the Americans as they could and as little humanity of the Iraqis as they could. Um, and the, and the whole Sutter city thing, the whole strategy of it is that I think the U S military was terrified. It was going to become another communist stronghold. So they, they really, really looked at it with more suspicion than say the Sunni extremists that ended up becoming ISIS. Um, that's actually something I, uh, Scott Horton, uh, that I've, I've mentioned on the show before. No, is essentially, I, I don't know that I agree with all of this, but essentially, you know, we were Al Qaeda's buddies when we were in Iraq because we were still on happy diplomatic grounds with Saudi Arabia, um, despite the fact that some of those guys were killing Americans, um, you know, let, let alone killing, killing uh, their own Iraqi brothers and sisters. Um, but it, it once you kind of see that, you know, that the it, I, I think the reason that Raditz's book is so narrow is that's the only way it could be written um, to try to expand at any given point invited too many questions. And I think that they're like, oh, it's just a just a book about about combat. And it's just about the fighting, a little bit of home stuff, not, not much bullshit. Um but no, there's no they don't talk about overall strategy. They don't talk about I don't I haven't heard any officers worried about their men making it to the end of the day. Or and I mean NCOs or officers, any leaders worried about their men making it through this. Um uh Miltenberger. Oh Miltenberger, I forgot to mention something about him. It showed that he had a dream while he was deployed or uh, that when he went to Kosovo. Do you remember that part with the, the sure. woman that approached the checkpoint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing like that happened. As far as I know, historically, Milton Berger hadn't been deployed before then. His bad premonitions came from his experiences with, I want to say, his uncle or dad that was a Vietnam veteran. And so he had the very natural, normal instincts of being afraid going into battle, having heard it from a relative. But they tried to change that around that instead of the premonition being someone who had served in a previous war and had been harmed by it, we have somebody brand new to combat and they're what they saw is exactly what we wanted them to see. Really? So that whole thing about the sort of flashback to Kosovo and the woman running onto the minefield that as far as you know, never happened, which is what this whole series is based on mm-hmm. so pretty, pretty heavily. Um, no, I, I I worked on that one for quite a while. I wanted I wanted to know. Um, and also, is at Kosovo. I, I don't know how long it's been since we've had active combat operations there. The MPs that I knew when I was just a young private that had served there, it was a peacekeeping mission. None of them had seen in any combat. You know, it, it, I. Um, so it, it I, I think that that was plucked out because it was it for people that served around that time. 
memories of deploying Kosovo or battle buddies that deployed in Kosovo would have been very recent. Um, and it kind of it, it ties in all of those bonds between earlier conflicts and others by saying it's always the bad guy. Americans are not the bad guys or Americans cannot be the bad guys, more likely. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we heard lots of people say that, you know, that we, we, we don't want to be the bad guys and everything. It's like, well, sorry, saying the words doesn't change it. Show us how you're not. Um, so, yeah, I, I plan to spend a whole bunch more time digging into this. Um, we learned very, very little about Thomas Young, about his injuries, about mm-hmm. and, 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 and most especially what you pointed out, Tom, about his anti-war beliefs following his injuries and how those were portrayed in the show. Um, I, uh, I've actually been thinking about contacting his mom and then speaking with her. I, I, I think that I, I know that she had mentioned, uh, um, she had mentioned in her interview with, with, um, was it with you or was that, am I thinking of Cindy Sheehan? You're thinking, I'm thinking of Cindy, Cindy Sheehan. Sheehan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, um, but no, I, 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 um, it's horrifying to me that they would tell the story of someone who in the, in that case was changed so radically by the war he was in and not honor that about him in the least, you know, show these stupid signs. And, and, um, and again, I think you and I talked about, about their, their mentioning that, that they weren't overtly political. That was kind of how they wrote it off. Not overtly political. Do you, have you ever met an anti-war activist? Whoever had that stupid thought? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 politics, it, it is, it's, it's all politics. And, and if, if people aren't willing to at least listen, it, 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 but yeah, it's, it's horrifying that they, that they didn't include some of that stuff. Um, yeah, well, I thought just, the, the, the episode focusing on Thomas Young was actually probably the best episode of the, the whole series um, for various reasons, but from a propaganda point of view is probably the worst because he's, presented as a young guy who's, you know, he wanted to get deployed to Afghanistan. That was the war that he thought he wanted to go and fight. Mm. Um, but for whatever reasons, he ends up in Iraq. And he's, he's not exactly gung-ho about it. He's kind of, seems like quite a sort of seriously minded young man, but he's not in any way sort of flash about it or, you know, wants to be out there shooting at people or yeah. Thinks that this is some somehow cool or whatever. Um, then he suffers this horrible injury, um, ends up paralyzed, and we get to see some of his suffering, and we get to see the problems with his girlfriend, and we get to see him kind of you know losing it in the car one day, and talking about all the things that he can't do anymore. But that's never really tied back to the war itself. We kind of get to sympathize with him and his suffering. But yeah. the ultimate cause of it is never articulated. And then we get to see him becoming a peace activist and he goes to Camp Casey and he meets Cindy Sheehan. And she told me that's, you know, that's where she met him. That kind of essentially yeah. actually happened. But that was one of the most stunning things in these army emails is that the producers asked the military's permission to have people wearing T-shirts with anti-war or peace slogans on them and have a few banners up with peace slogans and you know, names of organizations and what have you. Um, and as you say, the army reviewed the list, went down them, and they said, well, since this actually happened, and because they're not overtly political, it's all fine. And I'm, like you say, I'm thinking, well, how on earth is being a peace activist not political? You're talking about a government policy of war and that you're opposing it. How can you oppose government policy and that not be political. It just doesn't make any sense. Nope. Like you say, it just it's kind of the most dumb thing <laughs> in, in all of these 300 and some pages of emails. It's probably the dumbest thing in there. I mean, I'm glad that they said yes and that they actually included that scene in the series. Um, but I'm kind of like, well, why? I mean, if that's what actually happened, why did the producers feel they even needed to ask that question? How spineless yeah. are they? Um, and then the, the kind of the big letdown, the massive anti-climax in that scene is that they just bring up the swelling music and you see Thomas wheeling up the microphone and, you know, there's people clapping and whatever. And he says nothing. There's no dialogue. There's no 
this is my experience. This is why I changed. This is why I signed up in the first place and how I then became a peace activist as a result. Yeah. And that could have been enormously powerful and could have put a different complexion on the entire series. Because you sympathize with this guy. He's very much presented in a sympathetic fashion. And the actor is yeah. a good actor. And, you know, you like him. Um, and yet they kind of take all of that build up. And then it's, it's just nothing. It's just, oh, some swelling music and a bit of slightly slow motion camera work. It's just emotion. There's no yeah. actual idea there. There's no attempt to articulate or explain or explore anything. And like you were saying before, this almost pathological aversion to actually talking about anything serious in a serious way. It's just saccharine sentimentality. And that's a horrible thing to reduce the life of someone who signed up to go and, you know, fight for his country, presumably believed that's what he was doing. He was doing the right thing, then got horribly injured, so much so that his life was, you know, cut short only a few years later he died. To take that story and someone who, who changed so much, who was changed so much in the war, and reduce it to what's effectively a greeting card of a scene is sick. Um, and that the producers were so craven that they even had felt the need to ask the military's permission to put, you know, Iraq veterans against the war on a t shirt. Yeah. Through them. Yeah. Well there was there was one more note I had here I wanted to mention about Young's portrayal and it was uh, it had to do with when he was shot. You see in that in that moment, there were several other soldiers had been wounded just before he got shot. And the camera slow panned to him, what he is seeing down the side of his rifle. And he's looking at an insurgent who is looking right back at him down the site. And it's, it's a it's a pretty common cliche, especially among military movies that. You know, you catch somebody, you're both at your sights and who who fires the first shot, you know, mm -hmm. they implied that Young was looking at the man who crippled him and didn't and didn't fire. And therefore, that's why he got disabled. I, mm -hmm. I watch watching that. I, I felt very strongly that implication because you also had and I don't I don't know what the process of this was, but. From the moment the round hit him, he just went to the ground. He didn't speak. He didn't do anything. He just went to the ground. Again, another one of those movie cliches about becoming crippled or disabled. You know, it, each situation would present it in a different way. But we've always seen, you know, that the immediate injury, especially if it's one that's not serious on the surface, but serious underneath. And it, mm -hmm. it shows us that. And so I, I think that that was the implication. I think that they wanted to say in not certainly not in words but that he his hesitation was the reason he didn't fire and therefore the reason that he's crippled almost like he had it coming to him yet yeah, be for not for not fighting in the way that they wanted no i think you're right i think that probably was what they were trying to at least imply you know for those who were paying attention and yeah. not just kind of casually watching this combat series as a piece of action entertainment. Um, yeah, I think that probably was what they were trying to say to that, that section of the audience, is that this is the price you pay for not just firing as soon as you can. Yeah, This is the price you pay for stopping and thinking about whether this is the right thing to do. Um, almost like they were posthumously having a dig at him almost like they were exploiting the fact that now that Thomas Young is dead and, you know, can't answer to any of this, can't criticize any of this, they can kind of say what they want about him. Uh, and much like with the thing I had with that Sergeant, this morning. You know, much like the thing with Sergeant Mitchell and moving his death to a point that's more convenient for their narrative, they're just exploiting the fact that these people are dead and can't do anything about it in order to tell as far as we can tell, fictional stories about them for propaganda purposes. And that kind of betrays, again, just how callous, I don't know about 
the Department of Defense as a whole, but certainly how callous the people working in the PR and public affairs and entertainment liaison office network, that they don't, they don't care about these people. They care about what the audience thinks about these people. That's what matters to them. The people themselves, well, it's like, well, they're dead, so we can say, we can say what we like about them. And that's... <sighs> I mean, you know what I mean? We expect a certain amount of political spin from any organization or institution. Sure. But most organizations and institutions, firstly, don't, their employees don't die on the job with yeah. alarming regularity. Yeah. And secondly, they don't exploit those deaths in order to try and get other people to recruit and sign up or advocate or send money or whatever it is they're trying to get them to do. And I just think it's, it's it's almost almost inhuman what they're doing because like you were saying before there is this big the, the big kind of overriding emotive prejudice of this series is the americans are human beings the arabs aren't the iraqis aren't yeah but they're also saying you know so, somewhat more subtly that the one guy who because of what he suffered in this war turned against us, turned against the military way of life, turned against the empire, turned against the war, he's also subject to a bit of criticism and a bit of skepticism and a bit of character assassination. Yeah, if, if, if no one had heard the name Thomas Young before they watched this series, chances are good that they wouldn't Google it or try to find out any more information. Um, no. and, 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 and also that, that runs along the lines of the normal... <sighs> Uh, the normal name calling and, and ad hominems that come from people who discount the military, you know, and, and, and that's why I mentioned about the family, about that the, that the propaganda machine has to, in order to survive now, it has to extend to the family. I had a, a comment on an article. I, I, I had shared an article on the Fortress feed and somebody else had shared it on their Facebook pay, uh, feed. And I had just seen that and I went, and I looked at a guy's comment and there was a guy on there who was he, he was a veteran, but not a combat veteran. And he had, had this I'll, I'll find it and send it to you when we're done. I, I can't think of where it is right now, but he had this little sure. comment that he made. And it was it was just like it was out of a Pentagon Plato propaganda machine. It was like, OK, well, yeah, I see you're you've got some some critical things you want to say about the military here. But what you need to do instead is um, you need to take them back. You need to say something nice about the military. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm very close on what I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. um, and that it, it, it really gave the impression that you're, oh, oh, that was that was the reason. The whole reason he mentioned about is that you're putting the troops down and they can't handle it. You know, that the Vietnam guys, that the it's for the veterans that we tell them we won Vietnam. It's for the veterans. We tell them that we did great in Iraq. You know, we're somehow maintaining this promise with them that they know what war we went to, but we're going to tell them it was better. You know, and, and that goes in 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 each direction. We're going to let them uh, take their feelings and 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 coddle them a little bit. But the reality, the actual reality, is completely skipped over. And you have all all these different people, like that guy on Facebook I mentioned, that are helping defend them so many different part and parcel people deep emotions and we defend against the the attacking force the attacking idea and so it it, it you know in, in a society that doesn't value intellectual uh thought nearly enough that it works really well on a on mm -hmm. a society of people who has the kind of issues with education that americans do it works it, it, it ties right into them, you know, and I haven't watched Band of Brothers or Saving Private Ryan in years, but at least those movies did not um, they did not tear apart history. You know, they didn't go and rewrite it to be as favorable as possible. Um, you know, there may have been things I haven't gone through Band of Brothers in that way, but no, sure, it sure. was. But it was, you know, the, the questions that it brought up, the things that the men did to each other to the enemy you know it, it was it was accurate um and so if you're somebody that's already been conditioned for so long to protect the military there's no reason you stop now you'd watch the long road home and wow those boys sacrificed a lot for our freedom 
you know, that lovely freedom blanket we like to throw over ourselves. Well, and, and just, um, I know we're going to wrap up soon, but one point I would like to make is just think about how few films and TV series um, have actually been made about the, the wars of the war on terror. You know, Afghanistan, Iraq, I guess now Libya, Syria, we could inf- include a few others if we wanted. Um, not that many. There's quite a few intelligence-based, you know, spy shows and spy films that are set in that world, a significant proportion of which have been sponsored by, you know, CIA, FBI, whoever else. Um, But in terms of, like, this sort of thing, you know, a war story, there aren't many. In fact, there aren't that many conventional war films being made at all anymore. And this is quite a conventional war film. This has, has that feel of, like, a World War II or or a, a film made in you know the 1960s about World War II, something like that, um, yeah. in that it is essentially a like you say a story about combat. That's primarily the narrative that drives the thing forward. And so, I guess what I'm saying by that is that in terms of trying to disrupt the now fairly negative public view of the Iraq War. I think this was quite an important show. And in terms of starting to try to codify that more sanitized, positive history, like that you were just describing, again, I think it's quite important because there just aren't that many of them. And in terms of mass appreciation of foreign policy and mass appreciation of history, and I guess now the Iraq war is history. I mean, I guess it's long enough, long ago enough that we could call it that. Um, Films and TV play a much bigger role than, you know, news articles or books or anything else in terms of mass consumption. Yeah. And so something like this, especially on a channel like National Geographic that has a reputation for, you know, documentaries and quite sort of staid, realistic programming and quite almost the more intellectual programming that you get tends to be on something like National Geographic. And so the kind of audience that they're aiming at are presumably the ones that do think a little bit that, you know, do want to have something that asks a few questions. But as you say before, it doesn't answer any of them. It almost systematically avoids answering any of them, except in the most basic, superficial, ahistorical, emotive way. And if that's what they set out to do, then I guess they accomplished it. But yeah, it's not. It's not, it's not something either of us, I think, particularly enjoyed watching by the end. Uh, no, no, no. It, it was it was nails on a chalkboard when it first started. And yeah, it, it, it was yeah, hard, a little bit harder at each step. Um, Noam Chomsky has a quote about that. Um, if you're tra- trying to control dissent or thought that you want to essentially do what you just mentioned, Thomas, that you want to simply not ask the questions. But in other areas, allow very, very deep debate on questions that we know there's no bodies buried under. And so they can say, then there's a a way for the detractors, for the Jake Tappers of CNN, so to speak, to kind of cover that up, to kind of, when when big questions come in, instead of asking the actual questions, questions like you and I are now here. What about the, the agency of the people in the film? What about the, the, the um, how, how Thomas Young was portrayed and such? Um, I'm trying, trying to think what would be a good jig tapper question to ask about that. Um, so, or so was it hard portraying these men? Was it, was it difficult? Did you work a lot? Did you have to run a lot? You know, ask those real simple, I'm trying to fill HLN hours kind of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and they call it journal. And, and, and that's how I'm sure you've seen it these days. You know that that's that's what we have to view on, on TV. But people trust it. People trust that stuff. There's that, you know, we, we, we all have that that automatic wanting to trust things stuff. Well, America just floats it out there, you know, that they're trustworthy. And, and, and that's the thing is that people should be willing to do what you, you and I are doing right here. But that's not the amount we consume. We consume a lot more TV and a lot more film than we ever could probably go through and analyze. Look, if, if it's historically based, is it accurate? You know, what, what, whatever lens we're looking through at the moment, um, you know, the, it, 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 
it allows the people that are the real, you know, the people that use the real, the true believers, you know, you have your true believers and then you have your people that kind of push them in the right direction. That guy that I mentioned on Facebook, he's a true believer. He really believes this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then it moves a little bit above him and and they know it's different. You know, you get guys that, you know, we've had some pretty intelligent generals in the last 20 years. They're not dumb. They know exactly what they were a part of and they just don't talk about it. They go to do their C-SPAN interviews and go work on their new network TV jobs and they they just don't bring it up. They bring up other things. They bring up other things that make it seem like they're analyzing leadership and that they're keeping tabs on the military when they're not. They're just helping it. So. Oh, sure, sure. The route uh, from whatever. Uh, being a military officer with some kind of public profile into being a all-purpose military analyst for a news network. And you've got to think, I mean, even if you even if you spend 20, 30 years in the military, there's still going to be an awful lot of things that you don't know about. There's still going to be mm-hmm. an awful lot of things that you've never experienced yourself, have no specialist knowledge of, have no colleagues that you've spoken to about at any length. And yet it seems like, oh, well, you're a whatever. You, you reach this level in the hierarchy. Therefore, we'll stick you on the news and ask you any military question we have, which would usually be something fairly simplistic and superficial. And so I guess they're kind of qualified to have some kind of opinion on it. But it's not like they're experts, but they're presented as though they are. They are. They are. And it's, it's kind of an extension of that idea you mentioned before about from the the British military recruiting about the boy seeing the parachutists Mm -hmm. that, you know, generals have that too. We see generals in everything on TV and they're, they're trusted and they're hard and they can fight if they have to, even if they're old and crusty and look like they're a million that we we could still send them in. You know, that's the TV generals thing, but it's Mm -hmm. exactly like you said, you know, and, and what's the old saying about wise men know what they don't know. You know, it's, it's that, they, they present this front of being, you know, I'm the general, I know this, and I went to airborne school, and and people throw it in their trust pile and say, okay, he's in 30 years in the military, he must know what he's doing. And it's those kind of simplistic thoughts that become series like The Long Road Home. So yeah. it's, it's those yeah. kind of, it's just propaganda. I can't, I can't think of another another way to think of it right now. So... No, no, I think I think that's accurate. And and you're right. I mean, in some ways, The Long Road Home is just a sort of eight hour docudrama version of the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps more emotionally engaging and emotionally persuasive. It's less relying on that sort of expert talking head, trust the authority element, because yeah, there is, yeah. a, you know, there's nothing to camera in this series. But in terms of plucking on your heartstrings and in terms of planting little ideas and little emotional attitudes in the audience's head. I think it's actually an extremely well-crafted and cleverly crafted piece of propaganda. Um, Great. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, I can't can't think of anything else to say. No, it's all all good, man. That's that's probably a great place for us to end today. Um, Okay. So, um, but what, uh, uh, having one of those memory kind of days, I'm sure you can tell, um, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast again, Tom. I, uh, I really enjoyed discussing this with you. Um, like I mentioned before about with, with Ben Fountain, I think that, um, I think that analysts, intellectuals such as yourself, looking at military things through that civilian lens and asking them to help it make sense, um, I think that's amazing. I think, and that's really what we need. You know, I, I um, wouldn't have stumbled upon this had you not suggested that we, uh, that we work on it. Um, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And although it, <laughs> it pisses me off to no length, it, um, it crystallizes where people are in normal discourse as far as the military, that they can make something like this and a whole bunch of people don't get up in arms about it. It shows you how good they're getting. So uh, um, but thank you for being here, Tom. And uh, I hope we uh, have you on the podcast again soon. Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me. It's always good to talk to you. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also on Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes 
at fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Patreon, Spotify, you name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a contributor at patreon.com. If you're not into doing a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple of bucks on PayPal. The link for that is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget that. We'll see you next time.